this book does not make as a principle no two-tier. No. It in fact does the opposite. It sort of implies that two-tier would be acceptable under certain circumstances. As far as I'm concerned, if the union has to make sacrifices in dealing with certain employers, the most important thing to do is preserve solidarity, and that means equality of sacrifice. And that's how the union maintains its strength. But the problem is that two-tier is the easiest thing uh, for a union leadership to do, because it seems like it hurts no one politically, um, namely all the current people, voters and all the current members and all the current leaders can all go without sacrifice, and the people who sacrifice are the new hires. But once those new hires get into the plant, it becomes just an impossible situation to maintain solidarity. If you're working next to somebody who makes $10 an hour more than you and who voted to keep their higher wages at your expense, don't ask me to defend them when management comes after them. And management will come after them because, after all, if you, there's a second tier, well, why not get rid of the first tier then? And so it just increases the probability and the pressure that management will put on the, first, on, on the higher wages. So you, you lose solidarity. I call it a cancer, and it really is. No union maintains solidarity that has two-tier. And this union should take a principled position that two-tier two solutions are out of the question in any circumstance. If they have to give something, then let them give, uh, share, and everybody will share the sacrifice. I'm Dan Hagen, Local 136, Region 5, under the leadership of Jim Wells, Regional Director. Assistant Director Gary Jones, and home of the 2006 World Champions, St. Louis Cardinals. I rise in support of the resolution that the resolution committee brought out onto the floor with 46 million uninsured, underinsured Americans in this country the past Republican administration for the last six years has not dealt with health care. For example, when they passed the law with the Medicare D and they negotiated a plan where a member signs up and they have to stay in that plan for one year, but the pharmaceutical companies can change a cost of that prescription every seven days, that's not in the best interest of the Americans. When the bankruptcy judges rules in favor of the corporations and they take away the health care of the retirees and under reorganization that companies such as the steel workers are making a profit nowadays, those retirees have lost their health care forever and the corporations are reaping millions and millions of dollars in profits. Next thing, employers are shifting costs and risks to individuals. And we need to resist such programs, such as the HSA, the health saving accounts. We need to adjust benefits for increases in medical inflation. We need to resist employers' attacks of all kinds on the retirees' health care. The UAW needs to stay committed to a universal single-payer plan to provide quality health care to all Americans, rich, poor, active, and the retirees. Health care in this country is not being addressed in the best interest of Americans, and is bigger than a corporation in UAW. That is why it's so very important to participate in the VCAP which strength, strengthens the UAW negotiated contract. Thank you. And I'd like to remind everyone that this, the roots of organized labor, specifically the UAW, are buried deep in the social movement. When Walter Ruther walked in Selma, Alabama, it with Martin Luther King, it wasn't because he was going to get his picture in the paper, it's because it was the right thing to do. We've been doing the right thing since the inception of the United Auto Workers. And standing by the poor and the lesser fortunate is our job and our duty and our obligation. That's what the UAW stands for. It's a community action program. We can't forget our roots. When President Bush created the Department of Homeland Security, 
He eliminated the collective bargaining for hundreds of thousands of federal workers, stating that their union rights and union power would prevent him from doing his job in the time of duty. 363 firefighters lost their lives on 911. Every one of them was a union member. 363 men rushed back into those burning towers to save people and bring them back out. Go went back in again until they were gone. Tell their families, tell the survivors' families that union rules get in the way of protecting people. I'm tired of it. I know this executive board is tired of it. We've got to start standing up. And I only have one question. If union rights had prevented the president from doing his job in a time of crisis, what was his excuse after Hurricane Katrina? I stand in favor. Uh, I stand in favor of these resolutions. Thank you. Millions of people all over America are thinking about jobs today. Post-war jobs. Jobs with a future. And thousands of young men are turning to one of the best employment agencies in the world, the regular Army recruiting offices. This fellow looks like a satisfied customer. How about it, Joe? Got yourself a new job? Me? Yeah, I just re-enlisted. I suppose you could call it a new job at that, because life in the regular Army in peacetime is a lot different from what we just went through. Good for you, Joe. By the way, are you married? I sure am. Don't I look it? What does your wife think about your re-enlisting? <laughs> well, you don't see me all cut and bruised, do you? Anyway, she's right over there. Let's ask her. Well, darling, I'm in. How do you like the idea of being an army wife? Oh, I love it, Joe. You know that. Oh, I think it's a perfectly grand idea. And am I glad I listened to reason when Joe first thought about signing up? Believe me, folks, regular army life in peacetime looks good to us. It's really a slick idea. Good job. Good pay when you consider all the extra advantages. Why, we can see this country of ours. Travel and learn things. And what's more, Joe can retire with an income that ranges from half pay after 20 years all the way up to three-quarters pay after 30 years in service. And for a first sergeant, that means $155 a month. That's a lot better than we could do in a civilian job. So if your boyfriend or husband is thinking about the regular army as a lifetime career, tell him to talk it over at the nearest recruiting office. It might prove to be the beginning of real living for you the way it has for us.